Hello, welcome to the All or Not On Podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. This is a North West based courier company delivering all across the UK. They can assist in home moves and removals to large, heavy and bulky items, collections and drop-offs. Fast, safe and reliable deliveries. Please get in touch for a free quote. You'll find all the information within the description. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome back to the All or Not On podcast with myself, Billy Moore, here. Uh, and today's special guest is former drama and martial artist, Paul Davies. But Paul, you've got like incredible stories. I've had a, a chat with you off camera a few times. We've um, we've spoke about Gary Spears, you know, and, and I've been like really intrigued to hear about this guy because I knew from, from history he was probably one of the hardest men to ever reside in Liverpool. So, just before we begin, tell us a little bit about you and what you're about. Yeah, I started working on nightclub doors when I was about 23. Um, various places. I started off like on a, a well, with a, a a guy called Jeff Stott who run the little dormer agency. He, do, he did like, um, you know, pop concerts on the university and stuff like that. And it, it he, he knew Gary, you know, and he sort of introduced me in a roundabout way. And I met other people like who knew Gary, and then I wound up started uh, training with Gary, the Gojuru karate style, you know. I remember the first time that I'd seen him teaching, I, I walked into this uh, dojo that he was running in St. Helens that was owned by a friend of mine. Is that um, where you're from? Yeah. St. Helens. And... Uh, I watched it for like an hour or so and I thought this doesn't look like your typical karate <laughs> class you know he looked like he was teaching mercenaries how to how to fight you know and I thought this is something else and uh, it, 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 I just I was hooked to, to start with just straight away and I trained under him for years after that he has some like incredible skills I mean he must have because like you know, he's been interviewed many times by fighting arts. You know, like for those that you know, this is this is Gary there. I've seen this one. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a little article here. Anyway, um, yeah. So, what what motivates you to to, to to train in that? I think it was just like a, a practical aspect, like you know, because like I was um, I wound up unemployed when I, when I was quite quite young and stuck for money and so a couple of friends of mine were working on doors and it seemed like uh, something that was always uh, reliable to earn a bit of a living you yeah. know in like bad economic times so I think but, like training with Gary just gave me some like set, a set of skills you know because like people talk about martial arts like you know what i mean and it's in some respects some some of it's almost become like an art form yeah. but the original concept of it was to fight and to be able to get home in one piece mm -hmm. and that was like the, the you know the, the the thing that gary instilled in everybody when he he, he, he taught was he as tough as everyone says he was. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you know about him, a few stories, because you were telling me off camera, and I, I, I think, wow. I was. I, I remember one, one incident I was working, like he, he used to do um, security for Silcox, the fur ground people in Southport, and he used to bring like all of his students in to, to, to work with him. And uh, one su Sunday, it was Orange Lodge Day, Orange Lodge Day was always a bad day for trouble. And we, he asked me to work on the fur ground with him. He left me on the go-kart ride, you know. Didn't didn't see him late, till later on in the afternoon. And then it was about like three o'clock where the pubs used to close then at mm. three o'clock. And all, all, all the people who'd been drinking all day had come out and they were all drunk. 
So there's a gang of lads come to the go kart ride to get in the queue. The old guy who run the ride, he said, "Don't let these on, Paul. They'll cause murder." You know, we've got kids on the rides and families and what have you. You know, drunken drunken men riding around on go karts is, a, you know, it's a no brainer. It's yeah. not not a good <coughs> thing. Of course. So when they get in the queue and I said, listen, lads, just give it a miss. You're going to have to leave it. Like, you know, you've all been drinking. You've had a good day. You know, this isn't for you. So they, they started arguing with me a little bit. And uh, one of, I remember one of them shouting at the back, chin him, Jimmy. And the one in front of me, like, you know, turned. And as, as he turned, I seen Gary and a couple of other, other guys who were working with us, like, appear behind them. So I just punched this guy right on the jawline, knocked him clean out. And then there was, there was just mayhem then. Gary used to have a set of nunchuckers, you know, rice files, <laughs> yeah. made out of aluminium, covered in blue leather. And this guy, who's a huge guy, must have been about six foot five and about 17 and a half stone. And you see all the Bruce Lee stuff where they're all flying round. <laughs> this was just like, he had it under his arm swung it round, caught this guy right under his ear, no cuts, no nothing, just completely asleep, you know. And then we had, like, all kinds of uh, grief, like, there, there was old women spitting on us, there was gang round us, like, you know, and we had to step back, and then the police came and cleared them all up. But that that impressed me with the nunchuckers, like, you know. Yeah, uh, just, just like, just was he just incredible with with with, um, with everything he did with yeah. his fighting skills? Yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, amazing, you know. I seen him like uh, working out on a punch bag once, you know, doing knees and elbows. Christ, anyone who ever co- you know collared one of them elbows or knees, God help them. He's he was a big guy as well, you know. Well, how tall was he? He was about like just just under six foot. Yeah, but like eighteen, nineteen, twenty stone, and he could move. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he used to tell me, like, when he was in Japan, he got befriended by a group of, uh, you know, junior sumo wrestlers. And they used to invite him to eat with them. And they, they'd have, like, have a big bowl of, like, stew, like a stew. they put all kinds in it. They'd sit there all day eating and drinking, you know. Just fucking putting weights on. Yeah. <laughs> but pe- people don't read, like, people watch sumo. And they don't realise like how powerful those guys are, you know what I mean? I, I remember like uh, I was in an, an old gym in uh, in Liverpool in Notty Ash some years back, Vicky Mundy's Barbell Club, and there was a, a guy who used to teach uh, Wichiru Karate, which is another Okinawan style. Harry Benfield, I think his name was, and someone asked him a question. He said, "Who were the ultimate martial artists, that, that, Harry?" And he said, without a doubt, sumo. He said, they just steamrolled it into the ground. Just pure strength. Yeah. And way behind them as well. Yeah. Plus, like, when, 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 they're, when they're going forward as well, they're striking with palms. It's just incredible force. And th- that, that really impressed Gary. You no. Know, well, they did. So what sort of experience or, or escapades did you have? Right, with Gary, you know, what was his mindset like as, as a, where was he from, New Zealand? Yeah, he was, he was half Maori, yeah. his mother was Maori, his dad was English, you know, he, he, he was actually bullied as a kid, you know, because like, you know, he was like, he was fat and overweight, but. He's got like that look, hasn't he? Yeah. But like, yeah, man, he fucking lethal. So tell us a little bit about your background growing up. Growing up, uh, like w- when I was younger, like I got into a bit of um, judo and a bit of boxing, but nothing, nothing really serious until like I come across Gary. After after Gary stopped teaching, I got involved in like uh, more like uh, grappling type arts. I found a style called uh, Kazuyarashi Ru. Yeah, you know, which is a form of Aiki Jiu Jitsu. I trained under a guy called Kirby Watson, and that I found that like really good for the doors because, it, you know, the techniques like uh, shimmy waza chokes, locks, and throws. You know, because um, 
you, you, you know, in the days, in modern times now with CCTV, you can't be going around punching and elbowing people and kicking people, you know. Mm. It's uh, it's easy, like, to, to control people and just get them off the premises, so to speak. Well, that's the rule of thumb now, isn't it? You yeah. need to kind of just remove them with minimum force, yeah, yeah. you know, but it still happens, mate. It's fucking oh, getting, yeah, yeah, it does happen. Yeah. It has to happen sometimes, yeah. without a doubt. I've been in a few experiences in myself, like, where I've had to use that kind of force and... And, uh, Do you think Dorman were known as bullies back? Yeah, definitely. Back, back, back in the day, like some you know. of them actually were, you know. Yeah. yeah. He, he got arrested at one point, didn't he? Uh, Gary for attempted murder. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about that because you know the background of that. Well, it's quite yeah. an interesting, quite an interesting story. Yeah, it was like G- Gary was a, was an avid like uh, pistol shooter. You wouldn't you know, think so, would you, with his martial arts skills? Like, yeah, but he viewed he viewed like um, pistols like as another form of martial arts. Really? Because but people don't understand what martial martial arts is. Do you, do you know what the word martial means? Tell us. Military, military arts. It's like martial law. Exactly. So martial so, military. So like the, you know, on the, on the feudal field, feudal battlefields of Japan, the samurai, you know. They were the ultimate martial artists, like, you know. Yeah. So, like, he viewed, like, pistols and shooting as another form of martial art. You know, in fact, I, 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 I remember seeing an article once where some, another martial artist described it as the martial art of the 20th century. And uh, I, I remember seeing the first, the, the first time I seen Gary shoot, and I've never seen anyone so comfortable with like a, a weapon, you know, a deadly weapon. Mm. And it, it was just uh, mind boggling to watch how comfortable he was with it. You know, like, and you could see all the stances yeah. they used, like, you know, come from karate as well, you know. It was uh, something else to see. In fact, I said to him, like, forget the nunchuckers, Gary, teach me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the story, like, where he got charged with attempted murder, like, was. Uh, this is like second-hand information. Like I've, he, he's told me stories about it, and other people have told me stories about it. He was having a bit of a feud in Liverpool over a, something on a club door. I think it mentions part of the feud in one of the magazine articles there. And it, 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 the culmination of it, like, was someone kicked his door in of his house with a sawn-off shotgun and a balaclava. As he come across the top of the staircase to find out what was going on, this guy let a barrel go with a shotgun and blew half the staircase away. So Gary runs back in the bedroom, gets his uh, 9mm pistol that he had a licence for at the time, and put a magazine in it with plastic training rounds and fired two shots at this guy, but didn't kill him. You know, but he was in a, he was in a bad way. So he one, put him down, did he? Yeah. One of me... Uh, Another close friend was was at his house a, a couple of days later. He said there was blood all over the wall, you know. He said it was a horrific scene. So these, what are these firing, uh, these training rounds? Are they plastic, yeah? Yeah. These solid plastic? Yeah. So they would have still, like... They still, still do you damage. Would like, they but they penetrate, not, yeah. But yeah, but not as not as much as, um, <coughs> as, a, bully. as a brass round. Like no. Them. Yeah. So there is them, yeah, both in the head? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Wow. That's what mm. I was told. <laughs> and how and how did he get away with that one? Well, it, it went to court apparently. Like, and uh, the, I think there was, there was a point of law in it, like where the judge threw the case out because th- this is me going off second-hand information as well. Yeah, that's fine. Said like that um, if he hadn't done what he'd done, he wouldn't be alive today, or possibly wouldn't. But the police late like, later on, like he, they, they found a two-two rifle that wasn't on his licence that he was looking after for a friend from the gun club and he took his licence off him then. So he had a gun licence as well, yeah. martial artist. Yeah. You know, he was ready, weren't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, going over the years and that, you know, how long did you work with him for before he passed away? Well, like, the, the I used to work like an occasional night with him in a place in Southport called Follies which was like a biker's gaff, all the LZ. Was he like the Ed Zorman, was he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everywhere, everywhere he worked. Yeah. 
but the, this biker's gaff was full of Hells Angels, like, you know, particularly on a Thursday night. And you'd walk in there and you'd look around and you'd think, oh, my God. But he was comfortable with them because in New Zealand he was he was a Hells Angel. I'm sure you could identify and relate with yeah, them. They, they yeah. all respected him. Yeah. Oh, know. Brilliant. Oh, and how did he pass away? He, he got... He got... Uh, he, he got pancreatitis the survival rate for pancreatitis is quite uh, low quite low but um, he, he was living he was renting a room in a doctor's house and apparently the doctor came home found him collapsed in in the hallway got him into an he walked to the ambulance and he got him in the ambulance took him to the hospital they operated on because his, his pancreas had ruptured so while they were operating on him he had a cardiac arrest and died Fucking hell, lads, you know, you I, just I'll, only... I'll you, never forget the day that uh, I heard that he died. Like, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I sobbed, you know. You, were, you, you know, you must have been really close. Yeah. In a sense. And how long ago was that, Paul? That was 2001. A long time ago now, nearly 19 years ago. Yeah. Wow. And I that think, was... I think it was uh, February the 17th. <laughs> and my son had been born a month before. And where... Where was it that he passed away? In uh, Chester. Chester. Is that where he moved to? Yeah. So would you class him, right? He's probably the fucking hardest man to ever reside in Liverpool. Yeah. Didn't he tell you at one point that, like, or someone mentioned that, you know, if you lasted 30 seconds with this yeah, individual? I, I remember someone telling me about <coughs> a, a magazine article that someone wrote where he said, uh, he said, uh, he did this, I think it was Terry O'Neill, you know, it said, that he'd seen like people from all over the world, top martial artists, and some of them like were really capable people. He said, and if they could stand like thirty seconds with Gary, they'd have a good chance of beating him because he didn't train that much anymore and he was overweight. Yeah. He'd get tired and he'd get the better of him. He said, but I don't know anyone on the planet who could stand the first thirty seconds. Yeah, and he never lost ever. Not that I know of, no. So did you mention, you know, you mentioned Terry O'Neill, he's in this, is he, that's the, that's the number of this magazine? It's his magazine, yeah. Yeah, I'll so, Like, I, I lost those magazines some years ago. Yeah. I lent them to someone and forgot who I was, um, who, I, who I'd lent them to. And uh, Terry used to come down to, like, a, a bar that I used to work on called a News Bar on Water Street. And, like, when they did the original, the first interview, I I was with Gary the, the, on the day. And we sat in Terry O'Neill's house when they were doing the interview on, on tape then in the next room. Yeah. And they let me listen to the tape before it went into the magazines. And he it said, Terry said, said, have you still got the magazines? I said, I've, I've lost them. He said, I'll bring them in for you. He said, that's still the note there that he... Yeah, I just read that then. Uh, yeah. The four issues containing Gary's interviews here as promised. Um, for the, the apologies for the delay, had to dig deep to locate two of them. Best wishes, Terry O'Neill. So, Terry, another class fighter. Whoa. Right. Unreal. Another strong man. Right. Would you put him up against Gary? He'd As an equal, or would you would you say it was gonna be a close one or who's winning out of that one? Just as a just out of an, an opinion or Yeah, I, I I wouldn't like to say, you know. Gary, uh, Teddy's kicks were legendary. Yeah. You know? I mean, Gary's told me stories about him. He said he seen he seen one incident once, like outside a club called the Victoriana, where Teddy's foot came off the floor, kicked three people in the head, knocked the three of them out cold and never put his foot on the floor between the kicks. Fucking hell. Mm. That's just like in the air, there's just rapid kicks going yeah. off, isn't it? And there's, there's videos on YouTube, if you see, if you see Teddy's kicks... They're just so focused and you know so perfect. It's just unreal. Yeah, I've seen them. I did have a look at um, Gary's and him. I know we, um, there was something on YouTube where Gary was saying, like, you know, if, if you want to, you know, I think it was an elbow, and you go, you behead him. You know, <laughs> you know, that, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> you know, if you do it right, you behead him. You don't want to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> you just behead him. Because uh, he must have had, he must have been a character, you know. Unreal, yeah. So the likes of Frenchie, you must have, because you you've been in that martial arts era, you know, Alfie Lewis, Stephen French, yeah. Team Great Britain, Terry O'Neill, Gary Spears. Back 
back look right back in the eighties as I remember growing up, like it was it was a uh, Bruce Lee into the dragon, everyone was fucking jumping on that. Even me as a kid, I joined a, a karate club called Shotokan, right, Shotokan Karate um, in Speak. And my coach was a was a was a guy called David Parr, right? No I I joined because I loved watching Bruce Lee, you yeah. know. And we were I doing think, it. I think that set a set a few martial arts yeah, uh, trend right. in, in motion there. Yeah, it's key on kata uh, we started off, you know, it was like a moon yeah, shape. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Then slow slow motion, boom, boom. Yeah. And and yeah, it was um ha, 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 you know, yeah. all lines up like you see on the telly in, in, in um, these camps, you know, on Bruce Lee's fucking Ezra the Dragon, you're all doing that kind of yeah. stuff. You go from white belts. I don't think I got past white belt, but you know, I, I sort of wanted to do something a bit different than a joint boxing. You know, it's still a sport for me. But yeah, back back then it did set off a trend, and there's a few, there's a few, you know, big hitters back in the day. And uh, you know, Stevens being on, and he's talked about what was it, Koji Guri or something? Koji, what's, what's it called? What are you called it? That karate title. I forget go, me. I'm like Kajigugu. Gojuru. Gojuru. That means the hard and soft. So the, the principle behind that, like, is block soft, hit hard. Block soft, so just. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of the a lot of the blocks with the, like with shoulder cam, for instance, they're very hard blocks yeah. designed to like hurt people, you know. Whereas um, Gojuru, some of them hard blocks are still there, but you also have the soft blocks, you know, which were like more deflections. Just tapping things away. Yeah, sweeping things away with your arm, like. And, just they're cool. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. What would you say was the best martial arts about? Would you say it was? I think, I think, I think it, like any martial art can, can like be good. I think it depends on the individual, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, the individual can like, you, you can have someone like who's really good at karate, like yeah. kata, and then when they get into a real fight, they fall to pieces. Oh, yeah, you can just run up when the, the leg goes in, you, you just half Nelson and put them down and then you're on them and it, there's no movement then, it is, there's no defence. You know, there's not getting out of stuff. You I, rem I remember reading an, an article by, uh, like, a guy who did go to like, who was uh, in America called Peter Peter Urban and he was saying, like, that he considers judo a more violent art than karate and I, I read that and I thought, I'm not so sure about that. And then when I carried on reading about it, he said, well, you imagine throwing someone over your shoulder and landing them on a concrete floor. He said, there's no punch or kick ever going to do that much damage. Yeah, because it's all like, um, you're just using your body weight, aren't you, to propel someone, yeah. you know? And also, like, they have, like, uh, shimmy was the choke technique. You know, choking's, like, probably the quickest way of finishing someone permanently. Yeah. If the need arises, like that, you remember I was banged up in in jail with this 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 French Foreign Legion, this legionnaire. He was from from the UK, but he was on a soldier and he joined the Foreign Legion, and he he was showing me like some of the the martial arts they were taught yeah. within um within within the, within the forces, because it's like a special forces in it the Foreign Legion. It like Mars martial arts, military yeah, arts, yeah, military, military arts, and it was like a hold where you've got them round and it, but what you do is like a bare pee. Right, yeah. you throw yourself back, yeah. right? But as you come back, you're making a knot on yeah. his neck yeah. like that, and it comes up, and it's like the arts. You can imagine you go on, him, him jumping back, but you're coming down. You're coming down like that, yeah. in this position. Not a good place to be. No, and then you twist. He said, and that'll snap your neck yeah. in in no time. I was like, fucking hell, thanks for that. And he showed me a few others, and I'm in the part doing yeah. these moves. So I was always intrigued with him, um, with fighting. Yeah. And defending, you know, and you know, I've jumped in the ring with, with, with Musai combatants, which is the most lethal sport on the planet in a yeah. sense of like, you know, it's 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 recorded in history that, you know, the best of the best jumped in with the best of the best of the Thai boxers, right? So not one of them lasted fucking 67, 60 yeah. seconds cumulatively. Well, did you know Gar Gary was did Thai boxing as well? He had twenty two professional fights and lost one. Did he? Yeah. Wow. So. He'd be in, in in like the likes of Raymond Decker and stuff like that. He, you know, this I, think, I think the the guy who beat him was a guy called uh, 
Peter Constantine, who's another martial artist. And uh, it must have been a lot later then as well. Yeah, like Gary was. I think he was quite quite big as well. Like he was like going sixteen stone, but like in them pictures there, like he's close to twenty. Yeah. But um, he said that the reason he he beat him like was. Because Gary thought it was a five rounder and it was a three. Yeah, it's always it's always like your five rounds like was was like it's, it's normal yeah. on a Musai competition. You know, three rounds is like an amateur boxing fight. Yeah. So when I got in to fight the Musai, you know, combatants in in Thailand, and it was like a five rounder, I was like, oh, you're messing. Yeah. Right, I'll be gassing by round two. Yeah. You know, you want to do three more after that. You know, I've been five rounds, and and I've, it's you know it, it, it is hard. You've got to be fit. Don't get me wrong. I, so, do, I do remember like there, there was a close friend of mine went to watch one of Gary's Thai fights, and I, f- I forget where it was. I think it was up towards like Leeds way or Bradford, and he was fighting this Asian kid. And uh, do, do you know the, I, I forget the ritual before what would the name of the ritual before before the fight? Ram Mui. It Ram is. Mui, yeah. 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 Said, and at, at the end of it. <laughs> Gary used to have this thing that he, he brought into his style of karate where he'd jump jump up and land on one foot, you know, stomp on one foot. Yeah. You know, he, he said that was like a Maori thing, how they finish someone off. Yeah. They'd either do that with the foot or they'd do it like with the knees. He said, at the end of this, this little ritual, he did this big stomp and the whole ring just shook. And this Asian kid got out the ring, wouldn't fight him. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's um so you know, you've been you've done a lot of things. How old are you now, Paul? Sixty one. So you're getting to an, an age where you've experienced life, yeah. right? You're still physically fit. You know, I've seen you in the gym and you're strong, right? I've spotted you on on, on fucking fucking major ways, right? So you're you're a strong kid. Um but you were also a bodybuilder at one point as well, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, you've you've trained like in martial arts, you've worked on the doors, you've you bodybuilt that kind of life. Do you feel it's like like it, there's there's different lives for different people, isn't he? Yeah, some definitely. people some people like just you know settle for being like a bin man and a fucking a, 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 and children and, and and work day in day out yeah. and, and and don't want no trouble or conflict with anyone. It doesn't mean that you, you go to the gym and you do all this and you train, but when you're training in this kind of like the sport and you're physically active in the gym, you know, and you're standing on the doors, your life is about conflict. Yeah. You know what I mean? So how much conflict did you get? yourself into due to like your surroundings and where you was do, do, do you mean conflict like with altercations yeah because there must have yeah. been a lot of like scary times for you definitely yeah have you been attacked have you had to yeah yeah you know defend yourself one one of the most most uh, recent ones like some years ago um like i was i was working in a a place a place in southport and uh, there were there were a couple of steps going up to this this little bar, nice little bar, you know. I don't think I'd been working there that long, and I was working with people that I don't really know that well. And there was one night, like one of the regular guys had to take a night off, and we got a cover guard in, this big fat overweight guy, who was introduced to me by this young lad that I'm working with who I didn't really have much faith in. And uh, there was a. There, there, there was like I, I was stood inside there was all glass doors and windows and I looked over my shoulder and I could see these two guys arguing out, outside so I steps out and they're, they're getting knocked back because they've got like work gear on work boots and they're, they're just plain scruffy and dirty this was a, like a nice quite a nice bar and uh, turns out like the the the, the, the doorman who was standing in, his son had bought drugs off one of these guys a couple of weeks before. And he's saying, your son owes me a lot of money, you know. So uh, I'm stood there listening to this and I said, he said, listen, how much does my son owe you? And he said, he owes me 40 quid. And I'm like, 40 quid? A lot of money? I said, listen, mate. He said, go... He, he said, the, well, the doorman said, if I give you the 20 quid off the, off the 40 quid, will you leave it for tonight? I said, well, hang on a minute. You're giving him nothing. I said, listen, sort your debts out some other time. You're not coming in. Just 
on your way, you know. So he, he turns on me, then he starts like making all sorts of threats. And uh, th there was an, another club round the corner with this, who were the, all the doormen were working for the same firm that we were mm -hmm. working for. So about six of them come round because they heard all the screaming and shouting. <clears throat> and uh, this guy seen all the other doormen and g got off. Anyway, about 15 minutes later, they come back and he comes running up the steps at me with his hand behind his back and he, he's saying, I've got something for you. So just instant reaction, I kicked him. I caught him right under the ear and he went back off the step and cracked his head on the curb. I thought, oh, fuck, he's dead. You know, he was was cold, he out? Yeah. yeah. Out cold. Ambulance came. He was out for a good 20 minutes. You know what I mean? Wound up getting interviewed with the police. You know, got, got arrested. And uh, it, it, it wound up, uh, the charges just got dropped because there was insufficient evidence. Thank the Lord. <laughs> you know? Thank the Lord, lad. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, you've had some... Uh, You've had some really close shaves then, haven't you, really? Yeah, too, yeah. Did it get to a point in your life, though, and you think, I'm on a doors, I've had enough of this now, you know what I mean? Yeah, I've reached that point last year, I think, or the year before. Yeah. Because yeah. you still do a bit of security, don't you? Yeah. But, like, what what really got me, <coughs> like, was uh, the the COVID thing. You know, I mean, I couldn't I couldn't make sense of all, all the things, that all the rules that they were bringing out. And having us to try and enforce them, you know, like tell them girls not to go over to that table. Yeah. Tell them lads not to talk to them girls. Tell them to stop dancing. You've got a DJ playing. What do you expect? I don't know. You know. Young people are going to want to have a good time. It was shit, lads. It was confusion. Like let's yeah. play music, but sit down. Put your mask on to go to the toilet. Take it off when you come back and sit down. I couldn't be doing with it all. Yeah. yeah, and it's that like you just got fed up with that and thinking, yeah. fuck, I don't want to move on. Know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I probably missed the extra money, like you know what I mean. But I can live without it. You know what I mean? Without yeah. all the dramas and everybody wants to be a gangster these days as well, yeah. don't they? You do. It's certainly do. It's like you know, it. There's a lot of ego. Yeah. And chest at home, flying around, and yeah. you know, people don't want to back down and. You know, someone's got to be fucking like in your face. And as there was an old, there was a saying growing up, and I always heard, like, believed it. Like, doesn't matter how big you are. My uncle used to say, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. You know what I mean? And in a sense, he was right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he used to stick by that one because I was only small. You know what I mean? It was like, just fucking trying to navigate me that's, through life. That's what Gary used to always say. He said, don't take liberties. If you take liberties, it'll come back on you. Yeah, don't take advances, no, yeah. I remember Terry O'Neill telling me a story once, like about about Gary. Like it, there was um, a guy who come to the door of one of the clubs they were both working on, and uh, this this shows you how what what kind of character Gary was. I mean, everyone gets onto the fact how how bad he was, you know, and how tough he was. But he was actually a, he, had, he had a good heart as well, you know. And he, 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 Terry actually wanted to put this story in the magazine and Gary wouldn't let him. He said, they'll think I'm soft. Mm. He said, the, this guy come to the door. He said, and he was getting a bit cheeky. So Gary, uh, Terry wound up putting him a kip. He said, and Gary dragged him to the side, like sat, sat him up. He said, he went inside, got a beer towel, cleaned him all up and gave him a fiver for the taxi. Sent him home, he said. And Terry said, so what'd you do that for? He said, you can't let him just go home to his family like that. Yeah. You know. That, that's like a nice thing to, to do. That's, yeah. It's like, it's quite thoughtful as well, isn't it? You know what I mean? You know. One, one, of our, one of our mutual friends said, said about Gary once, he said, when he's nice, he's too nice. And when he's <laughs> nasty, he's too nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's not many people that can come and, you know, sit across from me and talk about, like, living and working with legends you know yeah. because that's truly what he was and i know that you know this this podcast this podcast is dedicated to your friend you know yeah. gary in a sense and we, we we chatted about that and you know the stories that you've you've got about him yeah. i'm pretty sure there's a lot more that you can't really divulge because Absolutely. you know you'll end up in prison <laughs> <laughs> or someone would yeah or someone would so 
you know, and pre, uh, you know, and and it's it's been like it's been I'm really grateful that you've come on, Paul. You know, and, and you know, spoke highly of of it because I've seen, you know, a few people with podcasts talk about them like they know, them. yeah, and they don't. They're just talking, you know, from what they've heard. You know, they've never met him. He was this. He was that. You know, but you've. You know, you've you've painted a picture of like you know he he can be tough and he can be nasty, but at the same time he can see he can be nice. You know what I mean? I had like a <coughs> a really um, acute sense of humour as well. You know, yeah, I had some laughs with him over the years. I remember once like Marvin Agler fought Thomas Hearns yeah. the first time, and this was long before satellite TV, and there was um, a live beaming of it to the Apollo Theatre in Manchester. And we just finished training, and there's uh, me, me, Gary, and a guy called Mike Lyons, who's quite notorious as well. They, they used to call him Hooker, you know. He said, he said, look, we're all going, we're going down to watch this fight. He, do you want to come? I said, I've not brought any money with me, you know. So Hooker said, like, yeah, I'll lend you some money. So he lent me the money, like, to, to go with them. And... Uh, the fight didn't start till like I think it was three o'clock in the morning, something like that. Yeah. So we went for a meal beforehand, and then watched the fight. The fight was over in like three rounds. It was a phenomenal thing to watch live as well, which yeah. was unheard of then. And then we we were going home, and somebody give Gary a, an E type Jag, you know. So he's dri driving us home in the E type Jag, and I said, "Listen, when we get home, I said, my mum and dad are going to be getting up." to go about the day, like, you know, so I've got a camp bed in, in my room, I'll set that up for you, get your head down on that. So he said, sound, yeah. So sets the camp bed up, one of these fold-out beds. Mm. So he, he gets on, on this camp bed, I get in my bed, and I'm just about to fall asleep, and I heard this almighty crash, spun round, like, he's on the floor and the bed's on top of him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going, Jesus, Dick. <laughs> Dick, he's not what he used to call yeah. you. What was that uh, that you, was, you mentioned about the pillow? What was under the pillow? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he, was, um, he was staying in a bed and breakfast it, in uh, just off Lime, just at the back of Lime Street. And uh, asked me to go to drive him to Wales one day to see a friend. So I said, yeah, okay, so Sunday morning this was. So Sunday morning I, I turned up at this hotel, knocks on the door, the guy who owned the hotel opened the door to me. He said, you can go and knock on his door and wake him up, I'm not doing it. So he goes and knocks on Gary's door on, on his room, opens the door, he said, yeah, come in. He said, I'll just have a wash. He said, D -d -d sit yourself down, so he sits on the bed. He said, have a look under me pillow there, Dick. So he looks under the pillow, he said, oh, I've, Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol. So I'm looking at it like, I said, that's nice, that. You know, he said, he comes and takes it off me. He said, there's only one thing better than a good 45 digger. I said, what's that? He puts your hand under the other pillow. He said, two. <laughs> that's class, that, isn't it? <laughs> that's a shout. Yeah. Right, so we've come to, we've come to the end of the, um, the, the, the podcast. It's been really nice speaking to you. Right, like, Paul, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Um, and I enjoy hearing those stories. It's kind of, it does, it does paint a picture, you know, of someone that I've always like wished that I've met, you know, and and had the opportunity to. That's one thing. Like, a, like, I mean, like people people wish that they were younger when they get to my age. Yeah. But I feel privileged that I was of I was of an age where I, I met him. Yeah. You know, he was part of my life. You know, a big part. Yeah. You know. Brilliant. So what would you say, this is a pearl of wisdom that's always asked at the end of every podcast, what would you say to a young Paul Davies now coming through the doors of life? If you had something to, to say to yourself, what would there's, it be? There's, there's, there's an old um, like saying that I, I heard from a Zen master, you know, that like stuck, struck a chord with me many years ago. And it always helps me when I've had like in times of turmoil, and it, it goes, um, yesterday and tomorrow do not exist, only now, the, 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 the present moment. So how can a mind of now be troubled by the pains of yesterday or the worries of tomorrow? Brilliant, enough said. And with that, 
Thank you. Yeah, good words. <laughs>